Hey, if we've never met, my name's James. I'm glad that you're here, and we're going to have a good, good day in church. Look at the person next to you and say, it's good to sit next to you today because today is going to be a good day. And if you're watching online, welcome. So glad if you're with us live or on delay, however you're watching or listening, it's, uh, it's great that you're here. Last week, we had an amazing day in church. We saw a lot of people get physically healed. And it was incredible. We had testimonies throughout the week of God healing people. We had an amazing uh, testimony in the last service. We put it up on social media a couple days ago of what God did literally right here. And God's just been stirring and doing something amazing in our church as we've made an intentional decision to make space and to step into the supernatural. Obviously, as a church, we've been going for probably a seven year, seven years birthday coming up in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, for the last seven years, we've always operated in the supernatural. We've seen healings. We've seen the prophetic. We've seen uh, uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But this year, God has just been stirring. He's been shaking the tree. He's been pruning the branches. And he's been stirring our church to step into a, a, an even more intentional season of the supernatural. And in response to God doing this, I wanted to preach a sermon today that puts the responsibility on you and I. This is the title of my sermon. It's called My Responsibility. Look at the person next to you and just say, it's my responsibility. God has given us two major blueprints in the New Testament for how we should do church. The first is found in Acts chapter 2, and it's where a newly inspired and Holy Spirit-filled church began to meet with each other in homes and in large gatherings. They were generous, and they saw signs and wonders being poured out. And so that's a blueprint of how we do church. How do we do church? We do it in homes, in connect groups, and we do it in large gatherings on Sunday and in other areas. We are generous with one another, and we aim to see signs and wonders that point to Jesus. God gave us uh, another blueprint as well of how we should outwork how we do leadership within the church, and it's found in Ephesians chapter 4. I've been preaching on this a little bit the last couple of months. It's been coming out more and more, and God's really been speaking to me about our church. Ephesians 4 verse 11, it says, so Christ himself gave the church us these wonderful gifts. He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And here's the reason, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And God's really been speaking to me through these couple of verses and through this blueprint that he's given us as a church. And he's really been speaking to me about how I want our church to look, act, and respond And it kind of stands against how modern day church has become. The job of the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers is to not be the superstars on stage that you come and watch. That's not our job. Our job is not to be paid actors or to be superstars that you come once a week and you watch, and you see it, you clap, you say amen, and you go home, and that's it. No, 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 that's not our job. Our job, when we get up on stage, or when we're off the stage, when we're in connect groups, or we're in grow classes, or just doing life together, our job is to equip the saints, to equip the believers, to equip those who call themselves followers of Jesus, to equip them to do the work of the Lord. That's our job. And unfortunately, church, modern day church, including ours, has gone away from this and it's become much more of a show. It's become a place where we come and we watch and we critique. When you go to a show, you critique. How was the sermon? Well, I didn't get much from the sermon today. Pastor James, he just, he just felt off. Him and Kate must have had a fight before uh, the service today. <laughs> right? You come and critique. We have a show. We, we come and we watch 
A show, a show doesn't change your life. It just tickles you for two hours. And we've reduced our relationship, unfortunately, so many times to just attending a church service once a week or once every two weeks or for some of us even once a month. And as we attend church, we think that we're doing what God's called us to do. But in reality, we're taking no responsibility for the larger kingdom goal. We just come, feed ourselves, make ourselves feel religiously better. And what we do is we leave the goals of building the kingdom, the, the kingdom expansion, uh, the heaven becoming real on earth. We leave that to the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers, because that's not my job. My job is just to show up at church, tick my religious box. But God's blueprint is clear. He wants all believers to participate in the expansion of his kingdom, not just a few chosen that get up on a microphone. You and I have the same call from God. It's just I've got a microphone on my face which enables me to dance with both hands. But you and I have the same responsibility. Yes, there's an apostle gift that I walk in, but when I get off the stage and I'm talking to somebody else, I'm not talking as an apostle, I'm talking as a believer in Jesus. And you and I, we have the same call. We each have a personal responsibility to increase the kingdom of God, to be salt and light, to bring light to the darkness. My job as a pastor is to raise up people and to equip you in order to do it. Now listen to me, don't, don't mistake us putting on a good service as a sign that we don't need to do anything in the room. What we're not gonna do is we're not gonna swing from a good service now to a terrible service where there's just no good sound, there's no lights, it's nothing here, and you come in, see, it's not a show now. <laughs> right? We turn the music right, right down so that everyone can hear your wonderful, amazing voice. <laughs> right? We're not, we're not going to swing to the other side. Don't mistake us putting effort into how we present the gospel as a sign that I can just sit and watch the gospel and not be a part of it. We all have a responsibility to grow the kingdom of God. And when it comes to the supernatural as well, I wanna let you know, you and I, not only do we have the responsibility, but we've been given the authority to step into seeing the supernatural flow through us. The last couple months, we've been seeing an, a sharp increase in healings, in deliverances, in the prophetic, but our goal is not for you to bring the sick to church so that they would be healed. It's that you would be the church and bring Jesus to people so they would be healed outside of this place. I love people getting healed here. I love people getting healed in the front corner here. I love it, I love it, I love it. But my goal is not to bring people into church so that they can get healed. My goal is that you would be the church. I would be the church and we bring healing to people wherever they are. We all have a responsibility when it comes to the supernatural. So today I want to go through a few of your responsibilities and I want to encourage you, if you don't usually take notes, it's okay, you don't need to write out my whole list, but, but this is what I want you to do. I want you to pull your phone out and I don't want you to go on Facebook. All right, don't, go on in, don't start playing your little games online. I want you to pull your phone out because I've got five responsibilities. And if all you do is write down your responsibilities, that's all I need you to do today because I want this not to just be a nice sermon that tickles you for two hours, but it's something you can go home, pull out your phone and go, this is my responsibility on Tuesday. Not just on Sunday. This is my responsibility in three weeks on a Thursday. This is my responsibility when I walk into my workplace tomorrow. The first responsibility is this. It's my responsibility to be the church not just attend it. And this is where we have to actively, and in our church, I'm telling you, we have to actively, every single week, fight against, and we have to put to death the worldly consumerism mindset that has come into the church. We are consumers in the world. We want things fast. We want things on our time. Grab delivery is the best and the worst thing that's ever happened to our society. 
It's amazing because I can sit at home and anything can be delivered in a second. It's terrible because we take that mentality and we take it into every area of our life. And we think that we should just sit down and let other people deliver it to us and do nothing. We just become consumers. We have to stop looking at church like it's a show that I attend once a week. You know how I view church? I was thinking about this. You know how I view church? I view church like a training hospital, not just a hospital. We talk about how church is like a hospital, but I view, do you know what a training hospital is? A training hospital is, is a hospital that, that does what it's supposed to do, helps heal, helps save, but they have a large emphasis on training medical students that come in. And so the number one priority of a training hospital is still it's to help people, right? It's to save those that are dying. It's to heal the sick. And, and as a church, that's our number one priority. It's to save those that are dying and eternal death. It's to show them Jesus and it's to help heal them, heal their lives, heal their brokenness, heal their marriages, heal their families, whatever it is. But once they get healed in the hospital, they don't just sit in the waiting room and hang out with other people. There's not exactly a nice vibe in a hospital waiting room, right? The only other people left in the hospital should be either those that are being healed or those that are being trained in order to be healers. And this is how we have to look at church is that there's people that are going to come in and we always need to have the space for people that are lost, that are broken, that are dying, that can come in and can be healed. But once they're healed, their job is not just to sit in the waiting room and keep getting served by the trainee doctors. You know what their job is to do? Is to jump on the other side of the wall and begin to be trained. What can I do to help? Oh, and my motivation is great now because I know I was healed, so now I can help other people that are in the same mess that I used to be in. We have to look at ourselves as not some show that you come and be entertained. I'm not your monkey. Some of y'all treat me like your monkey. I'm not going to do a song and dance for you. It's my job to train you and to equip you because there's people that are dying all around us. You might not see it physically, but spiritually people are dying all around us. It's our job to save people. We must transition those that have been healed into trainees that are being equipped to do the work of the Lord. And one day the trainees will become full-fledged spiritual doctors and they'll be able to train other people. This is called discipleship. And Jesus has called all of us to not just be disciples, but to make disciples. He didn't just call the people on the microphone to make disciples. He's called all of us, those that get here early to church and those that walk in 27 minutes late. That was an awkward giggle. He's called all of us to make disciples. It's my responsibility to be the church not to just attend it like it's a show. Yep. Good. And darkness sets. <laughs> and light returns. And that's exactly what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Ephesians 4.15, you know, Paul speaks to the Ephesians about their roles in the body of Christ. It says, instead, speak the truth in love. I love this. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. So Paul's putting an expectation on the church that we need to grow and we need to mature. For him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. You are a part of the body. You have a job to do. And that job is not to sit in church once a week. And don't reduce your relationship with the Lord to thinking that you're doing the job by sitting in church once a week. You know what church is? It's the, it's the petrol station. It's the gas station. You come, you get refueled for the week, you get inspired, you get revelation, you get built up, 
If you come in on empty, like Kate was saying before, you get built up so you can go out on a full tank and do what God has called you and I to do. So now we know what we need to do. Could I put it to you that how we do it is just as important as what we need to do, which leads me to my second responsibility today. It's my responsibility to have the right motivation. This is real simple. Our motivation for seeing the power of God move through our lives, it must be driven by love for people and not for our own personal gain. This is something we have to fight against. We have to fight against the negative self-pridefulness that will come and attach itself to us once we see the power of God beginning to move through us. Jesus has to be our example here. He has to be the example that we look at. I love how Paul described it. Philippians 2, verse 3. This is one of my favorite descriptions of Jesus. He says, don't be selfish and don't try and impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. So Paul is telling us, hey, don't be selfish. Don't oppress others. Be humble. Think about, this is not about you. This is about others. And you need, to be the ex- you need to be the way that Jesus was. You need to live with the same attitude that Jesus had. And this is how Jesus lived. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and he died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God, the father. Jesus gave up divine privileges. Isn't that wonderful? The Philippines is a very class-based system, and there's some people that think that their class allows them to not have to do the work of the Lord. That the same privileges that you're afforded at home where other people serve you is the same privileges that you expect when you come to church. Could I put it to you that when you come to our church, your class doesn't matter? I don't care how much money you made. I don't care what school you went to. I don't care what your last name is, unless it's Michael Jordan. I don't care at all (laughs) who you are. If if Jesus could give up divine privilege, what who what is your earthly privilege? You can give it up too to serve other people. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Corey Turner came and preached. Wonderful day. He had the prophetic master class and Anyone to go to that prophetic master class? Come on. Do you, know, do you know, out of everything wonderful that happened today, you know what was the biggest thing that stood out to me? That, that it, it, it arrested my attention. And he went on about this for a while. It, it really got in my spirit. He said, when we prophesy, and we could substitute prophecy for praying for healing, deliverance, all signs and wonders, whenever we do something that involves the supernatural power of God, our motivation has to be love for people. It has to be. It can't be to build up our own spiritual pride. It can't be so that people would now know us. It can't be so that we can go out and now make a YouTube channel on how to actually pray for sick people now and how to prophesy. No, no, no. Our motivation, whenever we step out in faith and allow the presence and the power of God to work through us, it has to be motivated by love for people. And if our motivation can be the love of people, it will stop us becoming spiritually proud. I cannot stand spiritually proud people. It frustrates me. And and if, well, that's not very nice. No, no, I just feel like I have the same response as God because God opposes the proud. Spiritually proud people, I want to vomit. I want to vomit when I see spiritually proud people. It's people that think that because the gift of God, it elevates them above other people. No, if God has bestowed upon you a greater gift of prophecy or greater gift of healing or greater gift of whatever it is, if God's bestowed that upon you, you should become even more of a servant. 
out of the same mouth that some of these people prophesy, slander and gossip comes. How dare you? And then walk around like you're spiritually above other people. Walk around like you know how to unlock the spiritual keys and people and those people aren't spiritually taking care of you and you could grow this and that. Shut up. Who do you think you are? Your motivation is not love. Your motivation is to draw people to yourself, not to Christ. Your motivation is to draw people to yourself, and you can use all the little spiritual lingo that you want, but at the end of the day, you're drawing people to yourself, and you're not drawing them to Christ, and you're spiritually proud, and I promise you that the Lord will rebuke you at some point. There's a crazy story in Luke, Luke chapter 9, 51. This is one of the craziest stories that I think we, we just skim over a lot. It says, as the time approached for him, Jesus, to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely, resolutely, it's a, it's a, in Australia, we say it a different way. Uh, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village. So remember, Samaria is not a part of Israel at the time village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading to Jerusalem. So when the disciples, James and John, his two out of his three big boys, right? We're not talking about the 11th or 12th disciple. We're talking about number two and number three here. When James and John saw this, they asked the Lord, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? And Jesus turned and rebuked them. These two disciples We're still looking at the power of God and the miraculous gifts as a tool to accumulate power instead of blessing people. Their motivation was not for love of the lost. And Jesus turned and he rebuked them. We must make sure that as we step into the supernatural, as we pray, as we prophesy, as we give words of knowledge, that our motivation is for the love of people and it's not for building up our own pride. And some people, it would never happen to me. But what happens if you give a prophetic word for the first time and it comes true? And that person all of a sudden out of the heart of gratitude wants to give you a gift to say thank you. Oh, that'll test your motivation. If someone demands money to give a prophetic word or to heal, they are grifters. They are bad people. Bad. Bad, 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 bad. Because their motivation isn't the love of people. It's the love of money. And they're using their gift as a sideshow in order to build themselves up and not for people. So if you say, oh, this could never happen to me. Well, if you begin to move and operate in the supernatural, people are going to start coming to you. Oh, they, they give good prophetic words. Can I have a prayer? And, and the devil will try and come in and just go, see, look, wow, grub, look at you. Finally, the church has a prophet and it's you. Wow, if only the pastor would listen to you, this church would grow even more, right? And the devil will try and come in. Can I tell you, be on guard because the lion is roaming around. The the devil is like a lion roaming around, and he's looking to devour you with pride. So my responsibility is that I have to have the right motivation. And when I have the right motivation, then it's time to activate it. My next responsibility is that it's my responsibility to obey. I've already preached on this recently. If you didn't hear that, I want to encourage you to go hear, trust, and obey. Everyone can hear, but a lot less people trust and obey. And I think one of the biggest things that stops us from obeying God is actually our pride. Again, I hear what the Lord says, but then I begin to think of everything that could happen, all the consequences that could happen if this goes wrong. So the Lord says, pray for that person. And straight away in your head, you think, okay, what if I'm wrong? What if they're wrong? What if they think I'm an idiot? What if I look bad? What if they're uncomfortable with me? What if it doesn't work? What if I this? What if I that? What if I, what if I, 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 I? You notice everything's about how I look. It's about how I am looked upon. It's about how I am seen. All these questions ultimately come back to how I look. And so it reflects on this self-pride. This is what the Bible says about pride. I made mention of it before, but James 4, verse 6, 
It says, but he gives us more grace. And this is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James is connecting here, having humility with submitting to God. It's very difficult to be proud and submit to God at the same time. Like it is. It's very difficult to, be, to have pride in your heart and to submit to God. And if we are humble, if we kill pride, and if we're humble and we submit, which means that we obey, then it will be easier for us to resist the devil and he will flee from us. Because all those temptations, all those thoughts, all that stuff pointing back to us, 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 is the devil coming in trying to make it all about you and trying to get you to forget your motivation. Who cares about how you look? Why don't you care about the person in front of you that's broken? The moment you begin to have a motivation of love for people, it will stop your pride looking at your self-embarrassment. How am I going to, how am I going to, you got to step through it. The last couple of days, uh, Kate and I, uh, our family, and uh, Don and Albie, we all went down to Davao. It was, it was awesome. It was the first time I've ever been to Davao and I loved it. We are going to do a favor church in Davao. It's going to be incredible. Not anytime soon. It's okay. <laughs> we need to wait. We need, we need to build up. But I, I let, does anyone love Davao? I love, yeah, about 10 of you. That's good. <laughs> it's so far away. Uh, I had durian. I, uh, I had durian. White guy had durian and I didn't vomit. No vomit. It was very, very good. I had durian. I went to the crocodile farm, uh, which if you want to go to an animal sanctuary that has very loose rules and regulations, uh, it was, I looked death in the eyes. A tiger jumped at me and, and a monkey and I held a snake and a crocodile. My children held snakes and crocodile. Aslan made friends with an orangutan and then cried for a whole day because the orangutan's in a little cage. And, and it, was, it, was an, it, was, it was a wonderful weekend. Uh, but we actually went for a purpose. And the purpose was we went down and, and, um, and uh, Claudine San Jose, her mother, Tita Bing, uh, we love Tita Bing, uh, she organized this uh, 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 unity night of outflow anointing. Ten churches came together in a big tent, and they did this big thing. And, and so they asked me to come down and share. And it was a wonderful night. It was awesome. They got up. They were singing, dancing. It was, be it was beautiful. They were singing songs. I haven't sung some of these songs in 28 years, and it was like a flashback for me. Yeah, the river of light sets my feet a dance. Right? I was... <laughs> It was amazing. I was whistling to it. It was, it was a wonderful time. And I got, up, I got up to speak. And as I was getting up to speak, I actually looked at my phone. And on my phone, I saw another testimony. And when I say another, this morning I woke up and saw another one as well of another woman being healed of PCOS in our church. Friday, I'm about to get up another woman being healed of PCOS. We've had, we've had I think, three or four in the last week alone, right? So I get up. I, I, as I'm about to get up, I look and I see someone had written it in our staff. I think it was Bell or someone had, had written a testimony. And I looked at it. And I, as I was getting on stage, I felt the Holy Spirit say, there is an unusual anointing on your house. And I'm a part of the house, so it's on me, right? If it's on me, it's on you. If, it's a part of, if you're a part of this house, it's on you. There's an unusual anointing to heal PCOS. So I want you to pray for people tonight for PCOS. And I'm like, oh, really, Lord? I had this old, whole intro planned. Like I was going to get up and be, hi, Magandangabi, right? Speak some of the Bisayan that I had learned as well. Well, uh, I don't know Bisayan at all. I can't speak it. I had all these things. And then I'm sitting there. And then as I'm getting up, listen to me, as I'm getting up, I'm thinking, well, what if there's nobody here that, that has that? Then it's weird. And also PCOS, it's like I'm calling out your ovaries. Like your ovaries, do you want to come? You know, there's all these things running through my head. Right, and I'm sitting there and I'm fighting. And you know what? No, no, I'm being real honest with you. The pastor is having a moment of, well, what if no one comes? I'm gonna look stupid. Yo, I'm living what I'm preaching to you guys. And I'm sitting there and I'm fighting. This is all happening as I'm about to walk up on stage and I'm fighting God, but what if there's no one? This is super awkward and how are we gonna pray and everything? I'm like, ah. Then I, you know what got me? But what if? What if there's a girl here desperate? 
that she's been praying and seeking and trying everything and nothing. And what if the unnatural anointing that seems to be in our house, what if it's here tonight? And so you know what I did? I got over my pride. I got over my pride. And I went, I said, is there anybody here tonight that has, and no one put their hand up for a little bit. I'm like, oh God, this is happening. (laughs) Right? And then like after about 15 seconds, a girl in the back put her hand up and another girl and two girls came out the front and we prayed. And man, did I pray. And in that moment, as I was praying, I was so humbled. And it wasn't a thing of, I listened to you, Lord. Because even as we obey, we can still get proud in our obedience. Right? So even as I sat there, I didn't go, oh, God, I listened to you. Hurrah. I said, oh, God, I'm so thankful I listened to you because these two girls got a touch of God tonight. We got to kill our pride. We got to get the right motivation, and we have to obey. We have to obey. We have to obey. If something is telling you pray for that person, it ain't the devil. If something's telling you be generous to that person, it ain't the devil. We have to obey. It's my responsibility to obey. If you hear and don't obey, you will be like the man who built his house on the sand. And when the storms come, if you can't obey in the easy times, you ain't going to be able to obey in the storm time. As we begin to obey and as we operate in the supernatural, we have a huge responsibility. And this is my next responsibility. And it's this. It's my responsibility to have the correct theology and tone. Also, the word is correct, not correct. I'm saying my words, it's Davao. I go to Davao for one weekend and my words change. We got to have the correct theology and tone. Let me explain it. Um, This is huge. This is either going to push people away from God or draw people closer. Learning the correct theology is a lifelong endeavor, but it's my responsibility to be growing in it. It's my responsibility to learn theology. And you're not going to learn theology just coming to church once a week at all. That you're not going to learn good theology by just sitting in. You'll learn some, and you should learn some. But if this is the extent of the theology that you're learning, learning what the Bible says, what the Bible means, what God means, how he wants us to live, then you're not going to get it if you're just leaving it up to a Sunday. We must have the correct theology when it comes to the gift of the Spirit and moving in the supernatural. Last week, I preached on our church's theology that we have for healing. If you didn't listen to it, you got to listen to it. I talked about what we believe, what the Bible says, and what we believe. We have grow classes that teaches about what we believe for the prophetic, what we believe for healing, what we believe for deliverances. You've got to sign up in those grow classes so that you can help grow your theology. We have to believe the right biblical things. Tongues, prophecy, gifts of the Spirit, they're all for today. But as we minister, not only do we have to believe the right things, but we have to have the right tone as we minister. Because even if you believe the right things, you can just say the wrong things, and it can end up pushing people away. What are some of the examples? Some of the examples are you pray for someone, they don't get healed, and they look at you and you say, well, obviously you don't have enough faith to be healed. No. Firstly, that's wrong theology. But secondly, that's so insensitive. Just because you're allowed to speak the truth doesn't mean you're allowed to be insensitive. The Bible tells us to speak the truth in love, right? You can be sensitive about stuff. So we have to make sure we have the right tone. Don't tell people to stop going to doctors. Well, we believe in healing in our church, and every time you go to a doctor, that means you don't have the faith to believe. You don't have the faith. Don't go to that doctor. Don't take the medicine. Hold snakes, right? Like, (laughs) drink poison with me, right? These are like the crazy. No, no, no. Paul told Timothy, Paul, who saw more miracles than you and I will ever see in our lifetime, told Timothy to have a little bit of wine to settle his stomach because he needed it for medicinal purposes. If Paul can say that, could I put it to you? If you need to go to the doctor, go to the doctor. Have the right tone 
about how you do things. So don't tell people to stop going to the doctor or going to the doctor reflects your lack of faith. No, going to the doctor. God has given people medication. God supernaturally allowed people to come up. I am so glad for paracetamol. I'm so glad for Tylenol. Tylenol. I can't say anything today. I'm so glad for antibiotics, right? Come on. I'm so glad for all this medication that God has given us that we can use. We need to have the right tone when we begin to share. Just because you saw one healing doesn't mean you're now the expert on healing. Some of y'all need to get off social media and shut your mouths. Some people's social media, you would think that they're now the be-all, end-all, that they've seen decades of healing and decades of this. No, shut your mouth. Get off social media. Stop making fun of other people on social media as well or pulling down other churches because they don't believe what you believe on social media. Get off social media and start having real life-to-life -life interaction. Some of y'all want so desperately to put your own image out there. Why don't you wait for somebody to ask you for your opinion instead of just giving your opinion about something? Golly, that'd save a few marriages. That has no reflection on my marriage. I love my wife's opinion. Every opinion that she gives, I hold on to it. And I love it. When you're prophesying, operating in the spirit, don't give someone a huge, massive, life-changing potential prophecy unless you've cleared it with someone that's more mature. Yeah. It's your responsibility to have the right tone. Yeah. Don't go up to someone and say, you're going to marry this person the Lord has spoken. Don't do that. Shut your mouth. Yeah. That's not your place to do that. Yeah. But if you feel something from the Lord, go check it with, oh, I know this is big, but I want to check it with you. You know why? Your motivation will drive you to humbly go and submit it to somebody else. You know why? Because your motivation is for love of that person, not to make yourself look good. So if your motivation is for love, you will humbly submit it to someone. And even how you prophesy, how you prophesy it's your responsibility to get the right tone. I gave a prophetic word a couple of months ago. I was in Australia. I was preaching, and there was a young man that was off the stage, and God gave me a whole picture of this young man of what to say. And as I began to say it, I only told publicly about 50% of what I saw. Because the other 50%, if I had said, if I had said it publicly, it, it could have come across as condescending, and it could have come across as me embarrassing this young man. And so what I did was I, I gave it, it was still pretty strong, the word, but there was an encouraging tone to it. And when I got off the stage, when we were alone, and this young man, he loves me, he respects me, I know how he would have interpreted what I said, but there's many other people that would have interpreted differently. So you know what? I found the right time, the right space when it was just us two, and I began to prophesy the other 50% over him, which was very strong. It was a very, it was almost a corrective, yet still encouraging word. And he's standing there with tears in his eyes, gives me a big hug. Thank you, Pastor James. I love it. Thank you so much. And he felt super encouraged. Just because God gives you a word doesn't mean you just have to splatter it out. It's your responsibility to learn when is the right time, the right place, and the right tone. The right tone. When we pray for healing. When we pray for people for healing, don't over-spiritualize it. I mean, this is what Jesus said, Matthew 6, verse 7. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. But they think that they'll be heard by their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Do you know how we pray? So here's the thing. I want everybody to start praying for people for healing. Yeah. Everybody. Last week, I literally invited people up the front. By the third service, half the church was out the front, all up the sides, praying for me. It was amazing right? I want you to pray for people. But when you pray for sickness, some people feel this pressure that they have to spiritualize their prayers. Some people spend, when they're praying for someone's sickness, they spend the first four sentences trying to come up with all the different names of God that they can before they actually deal with, oh, heavenly father, oh, prince of peace, wonderful counselor, mighty God. You are Jehovah Jireh, my provider. You are Jehovah Rapha, are here. You've, all you've just done is acknowledge all the different names of God. And that's good, and that's nice, 
but it's probably not the time and the place. You need to pray for that healing. So do you know how you should pray for people? Let me teach you really quickly. You have the authority given to you by the power of Jesus, right? Not because of your good works or because you have a secret formula of how to pray. It's because of what Jesus did. So wherever they're sick, if it's appropriate, lay hands. If it's not appropriate, if it's someone of the opposite gender, if it's someone of the opposite gender, say it's an ovary, what I'll do is I'll either grab a woman's hand to lay it on it, or I'll get her to put her hand and I'll put my hand over it so that it's appropriate. Again, don't you dare take advantage of a situation. So make sure it's appropriate. Lay your, if it's appropriate, lay your hand there. And you know what you do? Speak to the disease and command it to leave in the name of Jesus. You know many healing prayers only take 10 seconds, but we try and over-spiritualize it by add, because we feel this pressure that we gotta add all this other stuff in. If someone has a hurt knee, I prayed for someone on Friday night who tore their ACL. I said, God, right now, I come to you, you're a healer, and I just command this ligament to grow back together right now. Strengthen it right now, and I began to speak to it. Strengthen it, heal him right now in the name of Jesus. Heal him, amen. That was my prayer. It wasn't lacking faith. It wasn't too short. How, 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 much, how many more words do you want me to pray? Like, how many different ways can I pray for a ligament? No, 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 I'm being serious. Lord, we thank you. God strengthened this. God fused the ligament back together, Lord God. Fuse. What a great word. Fuse, Lord Jesus. Let his strength, Lord Jesus, I pray that as he bends his knee, let the strength come in back. That limit. Now, we can do that, and that's okay. And sometimes when we pray, we need to pray prayers of encouragement as well as we pray. But when we're dealing with a sickness, you don't need to get all fancy. You know what? God doesn't care about how fancy you are. And that person doesn't care either. They're just more concerned about the sickness and the disease that they have right now. And so it's my responsibility to know my tone. It's my responsibility to have the correct theology when it comes to it. I must have confidence in the Lord, but have humility before me. Let your tone draw people in, not push people away. And my last responsibility, and this is a much more personal one, and this might not be for everyone right now, but it will be at some point, is this. It's my responsibility to have faith for my miracle. When it comes to the supernatural, it's my responsibility to have faith. You know, it's crazy to think, but there's people in this room, there's people watching online that have actually grown accustomed to their sickness and have stopped believing that God can heal. They've stopped believing for miracles. I want to challenge you today that today is the day to begin to believe again. I want to challenge you that today is the day to stop putting up with that sickness, to stop putting up with that disease. The same doctors report time and time again, and it's actually to say, you know what? God can heal. Matthew chapter 9, the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, doctors, she spent everything she had. Doctors told her, no, 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 for 12 years. And as she went and as she touched the, the hem of Jesus' garment, he turned around. You know what Jesus said to her? This is the words that Jesus said. Your faith has healed you. 12 years and there was still something inside of her just this little glimmer of hope if I could just touch the hem of his garment then I could be healed her faith healed now don't try and make a connection that I'm not making here well that means if I'm not healed then I don't have faith no there's people that I've seen got healed with zero faith so don't don't make a wrong theology don't have wrong theology on this but if you got a sickness, if you, if you need a miracle, you got to get faith. Luke chapter 17, there's a leper. Luke chapter 18, there's a blind man. And Jesus heals them both. And you know what he says to them? He says, your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. Today is the day to stop putting up with the sickness that you've had for decades. To stop putting up with that same doctor's report. Last week, a young lady in our church was from Bacolod, moved up here to Manila, been attending our church for a couple months, and she dived into water five years ago, eardrum. Something happened with her eardrum. Then a couple years after, something happened with her other eardrum. 
it would resonate and vibrate pain, massive pain every time she listened to music, every time there was something loud. I'm, I'm surprised she lasted in our church two months, right? And uh, God, God must want her in our church because she said, and she even, I, I read it actually on her, on her Instagram. She said, I'd kind of just been putting up with this thing. And I finally decided I'm going to come down the front. She stopped just putting up with it. There was another girl who lives in China who got on my Facebook and wrote a comment and said that she'd had pain in her shoulder and in her back. I want to get this right. It was myofascial, myofascial, myofascial. Am I correct in that? I need a doctor on my staff because I'm looking and there's no <laughs> medical professionals. Here, Dr. Pinetta is here somewhere. I, uh, myofascial, right? I, I need, I, she had this pain. For 10 years, she'd been putting up with it, and she heard me say, stop putting up with it, and so she believed, and in that moment, instantly, as she was watching online from China, Ni Hao, watching online, she said her shoulder, just wrote it in my Facebook, she said her shoulder instantly just released, and the pain left, instantly. Come on, someone needs to say, she she ni to the Lord for that one in China. Come on, we reach in China. Huh? Well, I need. I'm just giving everything. Gong si fa cha. Right? Every week we give people an opportunity to be prayed for for a sickness. Stop sitting in your seats and wondering why God's not healing you. Every week, come out the front until you get your healing. I've told the story many times the last couple months of, of a girl named Allison who would bring her artistic and paraplegic daughter out the front for the last 15 years every time in worship she will bring her daughter in a wheelchair because she's believing that she's going to be healed and be able to speak 15 years in a row daughter still hasn't been healed but my goodness that lady's faith has inspired thousands of people including my own you got to take responsibility take responsibility for your health don't ask God to heal you of your lung disease and still smoke cigarettes. Don't ask God to heal you of your heart disease while you're sitting on your butt doing no physical activity at all. Don't ask God to heal you of your liver disease. He heals you and then you go straight back to alcohol. Take responsibility of your body. Have faith. Take responsibility of your body. Take responsibility of your faith for your miracle that you're believing for. You know, I believe that in our church, I really, really do, I have a strong conviction that we're going to see apostles raised up, we're going to see prophets, we're going to see evangelists, we're going to see pastors, shepherds, we're going to see teachers all raised up. And the more that we raise up, the more we're going to be able to equip. Being in Davao, man, God's doing something good here in Manila, but being in Davao, you know what was the biggest takeaway for me was this. As I was sitting there praying, God, we're going to do a church here. We're, we're, you know, I want to do a church, favorite church in every major city of, of the Philippines. And Davao is the third largest city. There's about 1.9 million people. Davao City is the largest landmass of a major city in the world, apparently. I never knew that. Apparently, it's the largest. It takes four hours to drive from one side to the other. <laughs> Same in Metro Manila, but we're. <laughs> Yo, is it just me or has the traffic gotten really bad like the last three weeks? What is going on? It's not FIBA. It's not the basketball. What school? Is it school? Man, keep the kids at home. No way. Thank God for school. I'm happy to put up for traffic if my children leave. In the morning, come home later. All right. You know, when I was in Dava and I was praying for our church, you know, you know what was probably the biggest revelation that I got is I was like, wow, God, if we're going to do favor church here, and Dava needs favor church, just like it needs all the other incredible churches that are already there. But I'm like, if we're going to do a church here, we really need to raise up more apostles, more prophets, more evangelists, more to This cannot, our church cannot just be about two or three superstars that are on the stage. And it's not in Manila, it's not. We have so many incredible people that preach, that teach, that serve, that equip in our church. But I, I, I'm telling you, if our church wants to have influence in this nation, it's not about the first three rows being hyped up and excited. It's about the last three rows being hyped up and excited. 
It's about every single one of us realizing that I have a responsibility to walk in the supernatural. If someone's sick, don't just wait for you. You know what I you know what annoys me is when some people, and I and I know there's people with the gift of healing. I do know. There's an increase, it just more people just seem to get healed when they pray for people, right? I get that. You know what annoys me is when I see certain people go, oh, this person said, come here. Let me take you to this person because this person, he's just going to pray for you. Like, I, I just get a little bit annoyed by that because I'm like, no, 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 no. Have faith. The same spirit. Yes, I know there's people with the gift of healing, but, but we can all see healing come through us. We can all see prophetic come through us. Man, you can deliver demons right in your workplace. It's going to be real awkward, but you can do it. You can do it. Our church, I'm telling you, we need to begin to walk in this five-fold ministry. Do not treat this church as a show. If you do, I'm going to make it as uncomfortable as I can for you. I've just decided. I've decided that Again, we make it comfortable. We have nice chairs. There's aircon works every now and then. Uh, we got great sound. The, the, the digital, everything is great here. We got great kids church. But I want to make it as uncomfortable for you to slip into a show mentality. We need an army, not patrons. We're not called the patrons of the Lord. You don't need to buy a ticket to come watch. We're the army of the Lord. The army of the Lord. And it's my responsibility. Amen.